this is how wars begin. Now, my guess is that it was an accident by Russia. They weren't intending deliberately to attack Poland. It's not a rerun of 1939, but it just shows that, in fact, these missiles are not nearly as sophisticated as people like to think. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And that was the foreign editor of Seven Sunrise shaking viewers on Wednesday morning with talk of war after a deadly missile hit Poland just across the Ukrainian border. Poland, of course, being a NATO country that other members are obliged to defend. And 24 hours later, in Thursday's Daily Telegraph, the warning of war was louder and clearer. Poll jolt. Poland missile strike has world on edge. Especially from the editorial inside the paper. In September 1939, at a time of extraordinary European tension, Germany launched a sudden and savage invasion of neighbouring Poland. This led within days to World War II, an unimaginably brutal six-year conflict that caused an estimated 50 million deaths. Yes, no doubts about the danger there. So, why all the fear? Well, coming up to 4pm on Tuesday afternoon in Poland, or Wednesday morning here, a stray missile hit the village of Szewadu, killing two farmers. And when the British papers broke that news to readers, they had no doubt who was responsible. Russian bombs hit Poland. Russian missiles hit Poland. Russia missiles kill two in NATO member Poland. In Germany too, the nation's top-selling tabloid build had no qualms about blaming Russia. And if you were watching Australian TV on Wednesday morning, after the news broke here around 6am, you would have got the same scary message. Breaking now, Russia strikes Poland. Russia has hit Poland with two rockets this morning. That's NATO territory, so the world is now holding its breath. Poland being hit by Russian missiles uh, takes the Ukraine war to an entirely... Such an escalation, isn't ...different it? level. But could we be sure it was a Russian strike? Not according to the ABC's Nick Dole, who told News Breakfast... We're getting uh, conflicting reports. The Pentagon, according uh, to the Reuters news agency, so far says it cannot corroborate uh, what has gone on. So, who was blaming Putin and whence the claim that Russia was at fault? It does follow a report coming from the United States, uh, from the Associated Press, quoting a senior US official saying that a Russian missile crossed the border from Ukraine and it went into Poland, killing two people. That senior official was anonymous, and the claim was not confirmed by Poland or the Pentagon. And despite Ukraine insisting it was a Russian strike, it rapidly became clear that it might not be. Just after 6am on Wednesday, as the TV breakfast shows were going to air, and 24 hours before the Daily Telly raised the ghost of 1939, weapons experts on Twitter were saying the Polish missile was from an S-300 air defence system, used by the Ukrainians to shoot down incoming missiles from Russia. And with the breakfast shows in full swing, still, the highly respected Ukraine weapons tracker was offering this definitive take to its 70,000 followers. So, what crashed in the village of Szewadu, Poland, today? With the cooperation of Blue Boy 1969, we analysed the available photos of fragments and came to a clear conclusion that they belong to the 48D6 motor of the 5V55 series missile of the S300 AD system, a Ukrainian one. So, how long did it take for the media to raise doubts or correct the record? Far too long. And considering how much rubbish the media can find on Twitter, it's pathetic they all missed that. But around 2pm, US President Joe Biden did cast doubt on the Russian story by warning journalists of the G20 in Bali... It's unlikely in the minds of the trajectory that it was fired from Russia, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. And a couple of hours after that, on Wednesday afternoon, Nine realised that the media had jumped the gun. In the last uh, few minutes, we've learnt that uh, three high-ranking US officials have briefed Associated Press. They are now saying it, it was, in fact, a Ukrainian missile that was fired at a Russian missile, and it's the Ukrainian missile that you're looking at in these pictures. It's the Ukrainian missile that has fallen into Polish territory. Completely changes the complexion of the story. Shortly after that, 10 and 7 News also accepted they had got it wrong. But on the ABC's The Drum at 6pm, the Australian's foreign editor Greg Sheridan was dismissing Biden's warning and still pointing the finger at Putin. It's hard to imagine that anyone else fired the missile except the Russians. Uh, Joe Biden said 
didn't seem to come from Russia, so presumably it was fired from Donbass or Crimea or perhaps from the sea. Um, Russia fired 100 missiles on Ukraine uh, in a day. No one else was firing missiles on Ukraine. And next morning, despite the head of NATO and the Polish president announcing the missile was fired by Ukraine, the telly's editorial was raising the ghost of 1939 and the Australian was leading its front page with this outdated headline. NATO locked in crisis talks over missile strike on Poland. With the story calling it a Russian-made missile and an editorial inside the paper warning... Missile hit risks European war. The deadly strike on Poland could trigger a response by NATO. When stories are developing fast, it's always a challenge for newspapers to keep up. But the Australian had more than enough time to get it right. It failed, and it failed big time. But perhaps the sudden departure of the paper's editor-in-chief, Chris Dorr, after he reportedly made lewd comments to a woman at a US News Corp gathering, an allegation he declined to comment on, could explain some of the confusion. But now to Qatar, where the biggest sporting event on earth kicked off on Sunday with the first match and an opening ceremony. Standing room only, Pete. Egypt. Just a huge mass of people mm. trying to watch the first ever game of the first ever World Cup held in the Middle East. Yes, the feast of football has begun, but the controversy over the hosts is not going away. In the UK, the BBC's main channel ignored the lavish opening ceremony and its face of football, Gary Lineker, kicked off the coverage with this. From accusations of corruption in the bidding process to the treatment of migrant workers who built the stadiums where many lost their lives. Homosexuality is illegal here. Women's rights and freedom of expression are in the spotlight. Stick to football, say FIFA. Well, we will, for a couple of minutes at least. Ever since Qatar won the rights to the tournament, there's been unrelenting criticism of its human rights record. And when journalists arrived last week, some found the welcome a little tense, as one Danish reporter discovered. Jamen, vi kan jo vise, hvordan forholdene er lige her, hvis vi drejer kameraet. Uh, we are live on Danish television, og uh, der kan I se, nu bliver, vi, nu bliver vi stoppet med at filme, og det er forholdene her. Uh, Mister, you invited the whole world to the... You, you invited the whole world to come here. Why can't we film? It's a public place. That is TV2's Rasmus Tantholder and his crew being rounded up on air by a gang of overzealous officials who weren't going to take supposedly all access accreditation passes for an answer. No, no, we don't need permit. Yeah. No, no, but, 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 no, but listen, but listen, but listen. But you can break the camera. You want to break the camera? Okay, you break the camera. Okay. Yes. So you're threatening us by, 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 by smashing the camera. The camera remained intact and they were eventually allowed to film. The crew later received an apology. But as Tantholder explained to Sky Sports in Britain, it's an insight into attitudes towards the media. The World Cup in Russia, we could film anywhere. In Brazil, we could film anywhere. In South Africa, we could film anywhere. Maybe it's a kind of a misunderstanding, but to me, it also shows how Qatar is when there's not a World Cup going on. Because obviously, this is what those security guards have been told to do under normal circumstances. Media access at the Cup has been described as very restrictive by Reporters Without Borders, who claim the system is being misused by Qatari authorities to ban journalists from covering certain subjects. But there have also been crackdowns in the World Cup media centre. US football reporter Grant Wall was pounced on last week when he lifted his phone to take a photo. Within seconds, a security guard walked over. Picture is not allowed, sir. I looked at him quizzically. But I was just taking a picture of the slogan on the wall. And what he said next was absolutely wild. Kindly delete it, sir, the guard said. Seriously? Seriously, as Wall asked. Is that how this World Cup is going to work? Among the most sensitive issues is the treatment of Qatar's migrant workers, several thousand of whom are alleged to have died in building the World Cup stadium. Another is what US officials allege to be Qatar's harbouring of terrorist financiers, which it denies. A fortnight ago, this offensive cartoon in a French satirical magazine, taking aim at that, had the country's Labour minister accusing the foreign media of racism. As he told the European Parliament... There are some media, unfortunately, who said that the, the Qataris uh, are a bunch of... The Qatari nationals are a bunch of uh, criminals, of terrorists. We do 
call upon all these organizations, all human rights, to condemn, to denounce such campaign, smear campaigns against our country. Ironically, Qatar is home to Al Jazeera, which broadcasts freely in English around the world. But reporting on domestic issues remains a challenge, with Qatar ranked 119th on the World Press Freedom Index. That, however, is much better than Iran, which ranks 178th out of 180 countries. And when the national coach, Carlos Queiroz, who is Portuguese, was put on the spot about its human rights record last week, his response was bizarre. Are you OK representing a country in Iran in this world that represses the rights of women? Can you, uh, to which uh, channel you work? Sky. How much you pay me to answer to that question? You are a private company, how much you pay me? Don't put in my mouth words that I did not say. I'm asking to your company how much you pay me to answer to that question. OK? To be fair to Keroz, speaking the truth would almost certainly have cost him his job. But with sport and politics deeply entangled in this World Cup, it's inevitable that questions like that will be asked. And finally, let's go to the Murdoch's New York Post for some important news, trailed on page one. Florida man makes announcement. Sounds exciting, but readers had to turn all the way to page 26 to get the goss, which was... With just 720 days to go before the next election, a Florida retiree made the surprise announcement Tuesday night that he was running for president. It is a classic piss take about a man the Post once praised. And in case you haven't got the joke, the Florida retiree was none other than... Avid golfer Donald J. Trump. With the paper cheerfully suggesting the twice impeached president and loser of the 2020 US election is now over par. His cholesterol levels are unknown, but his favourite food is a charred steak with ketchup. He has stated that his qualifications for office include being a stable genius. Amusing it may be, but it also signals a changing of the guard, confirming reports that Rupert Murdoch's outlets won't be backing Trump again. And in confirming that, the Murdoch's Wall Street Journal was equally downbeat about Trump's new dawn. The GOP and the country would be best served if Mr Trump ceded the field to the next generation of Republican leaders while it also reminded readers of his glaring character flaws. Narcissism, lack of self-control, abusive treatment of advisers, puerile vendettas. Smaller conservative media outlets across the US were also unimpressed, either mocking or insulting the former president with scathing headlines. The National Review simply saying... No! no! And kicking off his editorial with this memorable line. To paraphrase Voltaire after he attended an orgy, once was an experiment, twice would be perverse. Trump's tilt for the White House in 2024 would make it three times. And pundits across the major US TV networks were unanimous in describing Trump's big announcement as lacklustre, although they used a far more damaging term. I gotta be honest with you, I'm stupefied by it. It, it is. You know, to quote Donald Trump in 2015, uh, this was low energy. He seems, dare I pick a phrase, low energy. Low energy, uninspiring. It was so low energy that Jeb Bush called it low energy. I mean, really, like really low energy. So much so that even Fox News at one point got bored and cut away. And Fox News was not alone in losing interest. Some in the crowd at Mar-a-Lago were apparently prevented from using the exits. With ABC America's Jonathan Carl reporting, I actually saw people trying to leave, um, and, and people leaving early even before he was done. He's still speaking now. Uh, and, and then they, I think, perhaps a little concerned that, that the, hall would, the hall would empty out too much. They actually started preventing people from leaving. So now they're no longer allowing people to leave. Also abandoning Trump are big financial backers who now say it's time to move on. So does that all mean it's game over for Trump and the media? No way, says former Fox News journalist Megyn Kelly, who famously clashed with Trump in this 2015 TV debate. You've called women you don't like fat pigs, dogs, slobs, and disgusting animals. Your Twitter account Only is Rosie several... O'Donnell. No, it wasn't. Kelly is certainly no Trump fan after he said this about her following the interview. She starts asking me all sorts of ridiculous questions and... You know, you could see there was blood coming out of her eyes, uh, blood coming out of her wherever. But on Sky News last week, Megyn Kelly was talking up Trump's potency 
telling Paul Murray that Trump's supporters had not lost faith in him. I don't think his voters have gotten sick of his act, not one bit. And the more the media tries to tell us we're over it, the more they're going to back Trump. And by the way, a lot of those Trumplicans, you know, the people who are just voting for him, they don't care about saving the Republican Party. This is fun for them. They're enjoying the show. They like somebody who's still just a wrecking ball with a he's one big middle finger to everybody. That's what they're voting for. And Kelly says Trump will get more media coverage than other Republican candidates simply because he remains irresistible. Everything he says makes news. They love to talk about him. He's, he's interesting. He's dynamic. He's controversial to be sure, but he's exciting to talk about and to cover. That's not going to change. Only his detractors are writing pieces like he's boring now. Yeah. But he's not going to be boring. So the message is you can't write Trump off. And can the media really ignore the caravan, as most of them are now trying to do? We'll see. But with two years to the next election, they would have to look the other way for an awfully long time. That's all from us for tonight. Don't forget our latest episode of Media Bites on Facebook, YouTube and iView. We'll be back again next week at the same earlier time of 8.30. Until then, goodbye.